Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. We are back for this vlog. And I think today we're going to be talking about quarantine cages. Uh, obviously, uh, the ones I have behind me, those are for my shamrocks. And we've been talking about them. You were there with me as I built them all up. Well, now I want to talk about the uh, strategy that went behind making those a quarantine cage. Usually when you think about a quarantine cage, you think about this uh, smaller, minimalistic cage. And there's a good reason for that. And that's because when we're quarantining, I mean, okay, quarantine for one is to make sure that there's nothing wrong with the animal before you introduce it to the rest of your animals. And number two, you're trying to rid it of parasites. Uh, and yes, we can get into uh, when it's good to rid them of parasites, when it's good to hold back, because it's not always the best decision to, uh, to get rid of parasites. But that's... That's another vlog. Today, we're going to be talking about putting together the actual cage. Now, the reason why it's usually minimalistic is because uh, the, the parasite life cycle, generally speaking, the parasites uh, lay their eggs and the eggs are flushed out of the system of poop because the parasites are sitting in the gastrointestinal tract somewhere in there, depending upon the parasite. They produce eggs, oocysts, and those things go out in the poop. And the whole idea of the life cycle is that some other insect comes by and either eats a little bit of what's on the poop or brushes against the poop. And the eggs or oocysts hitch a ride with that insect, either uh, inside the insect as it's been eaten or on the legs. And that insect is then eaten by the chameleon. Now, you may be thinking, that is an amazingly complex life cycle. Why in the world would it do that? I don't know. They just do. You think that's crazy. Think about indirect life cycles. There are some parasites like the trematodes, the flukes, where they get pooped out. But then the, uh, the parasites then have to find an intermediary host, in this case, a snail, and then go through a life cycle within the snail before it gets to the definitive host, the end host. So that's a crazy life cycle. Obviously, if we have an, uh, a parasite with an indirect life cycle, uh, we don't have to worry about it so much because we don't have like snails crawling around our cage. So the life cycle is broken. And that's that's the key. When we're trying to rid our chameleon of parasites, we want to get rid of the parasite load and we want to break the, uh, the, the life cycle so the eggs can't get back into the chameleon. What we have to do is make sure that when that poop comes out, that that poop is isolated from the food source. That means we come at this with a two-prong effort. We remove the poop from the cage. We take all of those, as many of those uh, eggs as possible, get those out of there. I use a bleach wipe and uh, really wipe the area. We deep clean the floor. We wanna make sure there's no eggs looking for a ride to the chameleon's mouth. Two. We make sure that there's no food down there. Even if we, hypothetically, I'm not saying we should do this, but even if we never even cleaned up the poop, we could still break the life cycle by making sure that there was no food item that got down there. So if you could somehow make it so all of your food items stayed in their feeder run cup and never got down to the uh, bottom, we would break the life cycle even though there was eggs in the cage with the chameleon. So this is what we're thinking about. We want to break the life cycle in as many places as possible to rid the chameleon of the parasite. So you get, you have the medicine that somehow disrupts the life cycle. Uh, some of uh, the medicines kill the parasite. Some of the medicines make it so the parasite can't absorb nutrients, which in the end kills the parasite. Uh, and then we get rid of the eggs and then we control where the food is. So we're trying to break that uh, parasite life cycle in three different places. So that is why most quarantine cages that you see are minimalistic. It's because the fewer things that that poop can hit on its way down, the easier it is to break that life cycle. Now, we have the problem that we're trying to acclimate a wild caught chameleon. 
And the wild-caught chameleon takes security from being able to hide in plants. So you've got their emotional need, and then you got the physical situation. And I do not like to put them into minimalistic cages because their stress levels are just as important as the physical parasite load. We got to keep that stress down so the chameleon has to feel secure. So what I've got in these cages back here is a way that works for me. This is my quarantine approach. Okay, so we'll start at the beginning and I have to apologize ahead of time. I lost my wireless microphone. I cannot believe this. It is heartbreaking. I was on location. I don't know what happened. It's gone. So I am stuck at this desk so I can have good audio and talking to you. And then I'm just going to have to uh, take B-roll and then voice over the B-roll, which I, I would have rather have uh, been up there and you see me climbing all over the place getting shots. But c'est la vie. We're just going to have to roll with it. So I am going to be chair bound uh, when I'm doing filming until Wednesday. That's the day after tomorrow. That's when my, micro my replacement microphones come in. So. Anyway, first, what cage am I going to be using? I like to be using my full-size cage, a two by two by four foot tall cage, minimum, depending upon the species. For the shamrock chameleons, which are the ones that I have back there, two by two by four is a great size. They are smaller than a panther chameleon, so uh, they, they actually do well within a two by two by four. And yes, I love using natural plants. I love using live plants. Many people do not like using live plants because there is soil. And you know what? They, they've, got a, they've got a good point here. I can't argue with the, the logic behind it. There's soil. And once the parasites get in the soil, good luck ever getting that of them out. And that soil is always, you can assume the soil will always have parasite eggs or oocysts. So we go into this assuming that whatever plants, whatever live plants we put in there, we may have to throw out, depending upon the situation. So just, just go into it with that in mind. But let me tell you my approach as to why I use live plants in the first place. And that is 100% for the security of the chameleon. I want that chameleon to feel secure. I want there to be as little emotional stress as possible. They need to feel like they can be hidden. And if you look at the, uh, the cages behind me, that it does the job. So they're saying, but Bill, now that you've got poop in plants, doesn't this uh, totally mess up the situation? And it is something that you're going to have to deal with. The way I do it is I break up my cage essentially into two sections, the front half and the back half. The front half is filled with plants, but no branches. And so climbing, yes, they can climb on the plants, but is as long as I put a lot of really great climbing branches behind the plants, they have very little reason to climb on the plants. Doesn't mean they won't do it. It just means that they'll do a lot less of it. My strategy here is that if I have a branch network behind the plants, they will feel secure on the branch network behind the plants, not on the plants. And so uh, I make sure that the plant layer is just one plant deep, so it's very shallow. It doesn't need to be very deep. They don't need to be inside the plants to feel the security if you make like, like kind of like a curtain of plants. And if they do crawl on the plants, they're going to be uh, exposing themselves to the outside. If I have pothos, I got to be very careful. I don't want anything hanging down under where they're going to perch. So I make sure Anything that hangs down is hanging down the front where there's no branches. And so if they're there, they're going to feel a little bit uh, in the open. Now, behind the plants with the branches, I have the branches in a tiered network. So there's no branch that's above another. Now, in actual practice, you, you can't do 100%. But I'm going to do a little bit of a shot that comes in from the uh, bottom or top, depending upon how I do it. And you can see how the branches are uh, offset. So none is under the other. All right. So you're about to come 
from the bottom of the cage and I am going to put this into the cage. So hopefully you can see the plant front and going to the branch back. So you can see how the plants and the branches are separated. Oh yeah, and you can also see how the branches, the Pershing branches shouldn't be on top of each other. So wherever the chameleon is, he's not perching, he, he's not pooping on the branches below them. Basically, we want to make sure that when the chameleon poops, wherever the chameleon is, that poop goes directly down to the floor of the cage. And so we can be strategic in eliminating a great deal of the risk. Now, we can't eliminate all the risk. And the more risk you eliminate, the more emotional stress you'll bring to the chameleon. So it's a balance. And I'm not going to tell you that my balance is the absolute right balance. Uh, I know the risks that I am taking. I know the benefits that I am giving. And that is what I have chosen to do. As long as you understand the risks and the benefits, then you decide what balance you feel good about. So I have this branch network and the poop goes directly down to the floor is I get the plastic floor and then I drill holes because I don't want pooling water. When the poop hits the ground, I want it to be as dry as possible. The water going through the cage will go to the floor and then seep out into whatever you have under the cage. Now, in my cases, I have the Dragon Strand drainage trays under it and it catches all of the water. That water, of course, is considered parasite laden because it's got poop juice for lack of a better word, uh, in it. And so uh, I, I take precautions with that tray as well. I have a special wet dry vac, the uh, bucket head from Home Depot, that is uh, with a an, an attachment that uh, I suck up all the water and all of that is dedicated to the wild caught. I never use the a nozzle with the wild caught with a, uh, a captive hatched. And yeah, I know, okay, so it's just the drainage tray. The chameleon's not exposed to the drainage tray, but it's always good to have that as much of a separation as possible to avoid any sort of confusion, any sort of mistake. Now, one of those ways that we break the life cycle is that we make sure that the food has no contact with the poop. And to do that, I suggest using these feeder run cups. See, this is one that I've created and it's just out of a water jug. I cut it out. I use hot glue to glue something on the back uh, that, uh, that uh, my dubia and whatever else can climb up. I have drainage holes in there and something to uh, hang it with. Obviously, this is very cheap and it's meant to be thrown out. Anything that I use in a quarantine cage, I want it to be able to be thrown out. And so I don't want to put a, a, a real fancy feed to run cup in a quarantine cage. Yes, I can clean it, but you know what? There's a lot of nooks and crannies on those cups, so this is better. And the purpose of this is to contain the food items. Uh, you, you probably are not gonna be able to hand feed every single wild caught that comes through. Some won't accept it, some will. But by having one of these hanging in your cage, your chameleon can eat to its heart's content without having you looking over their shoulder. So. The idea behind this is that nothing gets out of here. Crickets are horrible for quarantine because they will jump out. And you gotta make sure that any cricket that jumps out is removed immediately so it's not eaten in the future. This is why in quarantine, I do a lot with dubia, superworms, black fly soldier, black soldier fly larva, silkworms, anything that I know is not gonna get out of here. And with that, you're able to now take care of your quarantine chameleon with the exact same care that you would any normal chameleon. Now, the one thing you really have to internalize and realize is that the number one way that parasites will travel from one chameleon to another is you, your hands, because it's your hands that go into the cage. They're, they're your hands that clean up the parasites at the bottom of the cage. They are your hands that latch the cage closed and then come back 
and open the cage with that same latch. You see how parasites that have uh, evolved over the millions of years to hitch rides with other animals to transport around would be able to use your hands to do the transporting. And so you need to embrace a protocol of extreme hygiene. This means washing your hands. This means wearing gloves. Remember, just because you're wearing gloves doesn't mean that the eggs don't hitch a ride with your hands. They do. They just hitch a ride on the gloves and it's easier to throw them away. But just because you're wearing gloves doesn't mean you can uh, clean up the bottom of one cage and then unlatch the other cage. You've just transferred the parasite, just not on your skin. Now, it sounds like that's a lot to keep in mind. And it is. Uh, quarantine is not something that I would uh, wish on anybody. I, you hear me say over and over again not to get wild-caught chameleons, and this is one of the pain points that you have to go through when you have a wild-caught chameleon. Now, let's talk about some more advanced topics in parasitism. There are aspects to parasites that we don't know for sure about, but we suspect there may be something going on. First of all, all parasites are different. And some parasites, like hookworms, don't just sit back and idly wait for something to walk by to, to, to catch a ride. Hookworms, at least the human hookworms and the dog hookworms, hatch and then they actively search out a host. I have not read any studies that say that the reptile hookworm is mobile and will seek out the host like the human and dog hookworms do, but I also would be surprised if they didn't. I mean, why would they lose that ability? I mean, if anybody out there knows or has a paper that says if they do or don't, please let me know because uh, that's uh, I'm endlessly I'm endlessly fascinated by hookworms. That's my my very strange hobby. But until we know that they don't, we need to consider that if there are hookworms in the poop, we may be actually having little hookworms looking for the chameleon. So maybe the chameleon is not safe all the way up on their branch, even if we break the food cycle. And the second thing is, what if the parasites modify the chameleon's behavior? You've heard me say off and on how, oh my goodness, this chameleon had to try hard to poop into their feeder cup. I literally have chameleons that look for the feeder cup to poop. I was talking to Jonathan Hill the other day, and he noticed that when he had chameleons with parasites, that they tended to poop on the leaves. Now, pooping on the leaves, pooping in their feeder run cup, why in the world would they do that? And it could be that there is some behavior modification that goes on at the parasite level to where they want to increase the odds of being able to uh, bump into an appropriate host. And what better way to make sure you increase the odds of bumping into the appropriate host if you get your previous host to deposit you where they run around. And before you start saying, wait a minute, how can a parasite change the behavior of an animal? I hate to tell you, this is common. This is scarily common. This happens in humans as well. If you ever want a, a good night's reading to really put you to bed and have sweet dreams, do a little research on Toxoplasma gondii. And so, yes, parasites change the behavior of their hosts to increase the chances of them reaching their definitive host. When a parasite that spends part of its lifestyle in a fish and needs to get to the bird, it will make the fish swim in its side so it's very reflective to attract the bird. So it modifies the fish's behavior to essentially commit suicide. There are some parasites that will make their insect host jump off to drown itself in the water just so that parasite can get on to its next life cycle stage. The world is an endlessly fascinating and kind of horrible place. So are certain parasites controlling chameleon behavior to make them more likely to poop where that poop can be encountered by another chameleon? It's possible. Once again, this is just a discussion between me and Jonathan trying to explain some of the things we've seen, but it's nowhere near out of the question that it's happening. In fact, some people would say they'd be surprised if it wasn't happening. So 
This whole situation is uh, a lot more complicated than we know at this time, but that in a nutshell is what I'm doing with Spearmint and Wintergreen back here, and it seems to be working. I, of course, have the ability to do fecals, and I do them on every poop that comes out of them, and so far we've gotten rid of some protozoa. So, yay us. <laughs> But this is the way that you check your progress. You're gonna to have to get fecals done. Either you do them yourself or you take them to the vet. And the industry standard is to get at least three negative fecals because you don't know when they're shedding the eggs. And if you're going, oh my goodness, how much money does that run into? Well, yeah, enough. Enough for me to say don't do it if you have a choice not to. Get yourself a captive hatched baby from a reputable breeder. So with them back there, I am very careful to know what parasites they have, to know what kind of load of parasites they have, and make my judgment as to what medication I will give them, or if I will just hold off. Okay, this has been a, a nice long vlog. It's been a tutorial vlog, but I wanted to talk about my method of uh, quarantining the chameleons because what you see behind me is not the standard that you usually see. This is a system that I've worked out over the years and I am very happy with it. And you are welcome to take this idea and use it yourself. Tomorrow I'm gonna to be starting the build for the Custom Reptile Habitat's Arboreal L enclosure. And so you're gonna be able to see a cage build from ground zero. And I wanna do a quick reminder of the 10% off coupon code that you have for the biodude.com, chameleon, 10. Enter that as a coupon code. You get 10% off your entire cart, except for a couple of cages. And uh, I get credit for that. And so you get to get a 10% discount for yourself and support the show at the same time. Win, win, win. And uh, so thebiodude.com, use the coupon code chameleon10. Thank you very much for dropping by and hanging out with me this morning. I'll see you next time.